my mom, uh, well, she had a privileged upbringing. My parents decided they just didn't want that kind of life, and they dropped that and moved to the country. My parents moved out there when, when I was six months old, and that was in the spring of 1937. My mother had always wanted to preserve the land as it was. Uh, she and my father had uh, kind of decided early on that they didn't really want to profit from this property. But the city wouldn't be able to do anything but maintain it as a nature preserve. Welcome to Habitat Makers, a video series about people and communities who are creating biodiverse habitat. My name is Gerald Gershon. In this episode, we're going to be looking at a new nature preserve, a 32-acre piece of property called the Cullen Nature Preserve. This is a personal project for me as well, as I'm a co-founder of the Friends of Cullen Nature Preserve. We're here talking with Heather Holm, another co-founder of the Friends of Cullen Nature Preserve. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. So here we are, we're on the actual homestead site that this preserve was the property of. Right, right. So can you tell us about the history, more about the history of the preserve? Sure, so as you said, it's a 32 acre property. And the really interesting part, it, it was owned by a single family since 1935. Where we are standing now on this grassy spot was where the house used to sit. One family lived here and the mother, Ann Colin Smith, lived until she was 106. So there's a real legacy of stewardship of this property. And she lived on the property till she was 105, right? Right. By herself. By herself, in the house, a very determined lady and also um, a conservationist. She really wanted to see this property preserved in perpetuity and that's why we are so fortunate to have it here as a, now as a public space. And how did it get preserved? Well, Anne uh, had the foresight to contact the Minnesota Land Trust and working with them, she developed a conservation easement for the property. And the easement itself outlines how the property will be preserved in perpetuity what uses would be allowable and other uses that would not be allowable. So she was able to be uh, a part of crafting the guidelines for this property, uh, even now that it's turned into city ownership. So she sold it to the city for less than half its value, right? Yes, yeah. She sold it to the city for less than half its value, which was a very generous donation. We were standing in a fully built suburb, so a 32-acre property that is natural is a very unusual thing in a suburb. It was just an absolutely generous gift for her to sell it for half its value. And when I look at some of the houses bordering the preserve, they're enormous, and you can only imagine how much this property is worth today. The friends are very grateful for her sacrifice and her family's sacrifice in terms of what they've done. Absolutely. To realize this new preserve. Um, and you said it was in, put into a land trust, and it also specifies what can and can't be done with the property. Right. And this is in perpetuity, correct? Right, in perpetuity. And that's part of the state land trust purview is that they can oversee to make sure that the tenants in, within the conservation easement are upheld in perpetuity. So that really truly protects the property from development, even if it's just uh, you know, active recreational development, if that was not part of the tenants. Um, so preservation is the primary goal here. And so the Friends Group is working with the city to make this vision become reality in terms of restoration. And so we'll be talking more about restoration, and this will be a multi-part series because the fortunate thing is that we can view this in different stages. And you'll learn about the restoration before it begins and see what the property looks like now. So what I'd like to do is let's walk over to one of the large oaks on this property because I want to ask you about the ecology, what it was like originally, and what is the vision 
for the restoration of the property. So why don't we head over this way, Heather? Sounds good. With the uh, friends of the Nature Preserve, I, I'm astounded with the good work they've done. My mother would be, I think, think it was way beyond her expectation about what would be done. There's so many volunteers working there and she loved volunteer work. She just loved volunteers. And the work that's being done there, I, I think she would just think it was marvelous. The friend's goals are the same as her goals. And, and uh, so it, it's turned out to be better than I expected and probably than she expected. So here we are in the midst of the Cullen Nature Preserve. And as you can see, there's a, a big old bur oak tree behind us, but very, very covered around it with buckthorn. So Heather, if you could describe the property. Sure. So the property has 32 acres. About 10 of those acres are a wetland to the south of where we're standing. And then the upland area has really interesting terrain. It has four distinct knolls. The knolls are sort of flat topped and then have sloping sides that slope down to the south toward the wetland. Once we start restoring the property, it'll really reveal this interesting terrain and, and topography. So what's the current state of the ecology? <laughs> well, as you can see behind us, and as you mentioned, this dark green plant that we see is one of our primary invasive plants here in, in the upper Midwest called European buckthorn. And it generally invades the understories of, of woodlands. When we look at this property though, and the large bur oak that you mentioned behind us, you can see it has very long, but now dead branches that are reaching out. And that is sort of a, a symptom of that it used to be open grown. So it formerly didn't have this tree cover of different species growing around it. So in a sense, this property has gone from being a savanna, which is a type of plant community that is basically oak trees within a prairie. So oak trees that grow very spaced apart, but with primarily a grassland and wildflower herbaceous ground layer. Over time and with fire suppression, this property has turned into a more forested state. And that forested state has really facilitated the invasion of some of these invasive plants, such as European buckthorn. So when we do the restoration, then how do we keep these species, the invasive species at bay? What's the strategy? Yeah, so there's a number of tools in the restoration toolbox. We'll be actually using logging type equipment to take out the large quantity of biomass of both the woody invasive plant species, but also some undesirable trees to start opening it up. The challenge when you start to open up a site like this that already has invasive plants present, uh, it really will encourage more invasive plants. So part of the strategy to compete with, you know, these small buckthorn that we have here growing in front of us, there'll be immediate seeding with grasses to help compete with some of the seed bank and small seedlings of invasive plants. We will also be reintroducing fire, which has been absent for much too long. This property would have been burned quite regularly by Native Americans. So fire is another tool that we can use to help combat some invasive plant species. So another thing to consider when doing a restoration, Heather had mentioned the neighbors to north of this property, is to make sure that you involve neighbors in the process and inform them what's going on. Because when people see trees, shrubs, greenery being removed, they might think that it's not a good thing, but it gets a little worse before it starts getting a lot better and it's necessary for restoration. As Heather mentioned, there's many old oak trees here. I feel like we're on the, really at the inflection point that if we didn't do something now, that this would just go downhill quickly. So let's look at one of the very old white oak trees on this property and talk more about what might happen here after the restoration. Why don't we go this way, Heather? All right. The birds I remember, there were a lot of 
uh, blue jays, of course. We also had a number of red-headed woodpeckers and scarlet tanagers and orioles and hummingbirds. My mother loved birds. She not only loved them on the property, but she traveled all over the world looking for birds. What I hope will happen on the property is, uh, I understand it's gonna be trying to restore it to the oak savanna of the past, the way it was when I was growing up. Maybe it's possible for those birds to be lured back. So here we are beneath one of the very old oaks on the property, the so-called Grandma Oak. One thing that first struck me when I came to this property and walked it was the amazing old oaks here throughout the property, but no young oaks, no adolescent oaks, no middle-aged oaks, they're all <laughs> old oaks. Right. Yeah. So please talk about the restoration in terms of the oaks and how to keep them going for generations. Yeah, so you, you can see why, if we just look in front of us, the, 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 the density of cover of European buckthorn on the ground and uh, the large stuff behind us here that is competing with the oak. So even though we have these beautiful geriatric, but some in this case still healthy old oaks, producing acorns, the acorns simply don't have the light they need. They may germinate, but those oak seedlings will not grow. We need a lot more light coming into this area in order to facilitate the next generation of oak growth. And for climate resiliency as well, this would be a stable ecosystem, right? Right, it would be quite stable, but also dynamic because all ecosystems in plant communities are dynamic. But we are looking at achieving as high a diversity as possible. So starting with plant diversity. So savannas would maintain these large oaks. This buckthorn would be replaced with a grass and wildflower mix understory and that would bring in a lot more insect species, which would help with bird species. So we're really trying to rebuild a comprehensive food web from the ground up. I should point out too that the Friends have been doing surveys. We've been doing surveys of the type of vegetation and the type and number of bird species. We're doing that for a couple years. So once the restoration is done and in progress, we'll continue the surveys and we'll be able to see how the increased biodiversity just keeps perpetuating itself and grows. Which brings us back to our vision of the red-headed woodpecker, which is a series in, in serious decline in Minnesota. Bill Cullen and Cullen Smith's son said he used to see that bird on this property and he was a boy. So what do you think the chances are of getting that bird back here? Well, red-headed woodpeckers, their habitat is oak savanna. They are a little bit different than some of our other common woodpecker species, such as the red-bellied or hairy or downy woodpecker. They like open spaces, they fly low. And then they also need really old oak trees for nesting cavities. So it's a combination of very specific things that here have been lost. Uh, if we return this to oak savanna, the real question is whether uh, populations will find it and whether or not it will actually be large enough to support a breeding population. So it remains to be seen. Yeah, one can hope, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Heather. And as you've seen, this is the ground stage of the restoration of this new nature preserve, the 32 acre. Cullen Nature Preserve. We will take you on the journey in future episodes of how the restoration is done and what comes back to life in this incredible ecosystem. Thank you.